The following are two more amazing stories about reincarnation where two people claim to have lived a past life. Philip Harding. Philip was only two and a half years of age when he went to Oxford, England with his Aunt Rosemary. At such a young age, Philip had never been to Oxford and if he had, he would have been too young to have observed anything that would have had any meaning. His Aunt Rosemary had only fleetingly been through on a coach, so neither would have had any knowledge of the ancient town. They had not been in the town very long when Philip asked his auntie whether they could visit the funny clock. She looked at him in a confused manner and said, What funny clock? Philip then went on to describe a large clock at the side of a church that had strange markings on its face. As his auntie had no idea what her nephew was talking about, she tried to change the subject by suggesting that they each get an ice cream and sweets while they were shopping. However, Philip was insistent and Zadi had to admit that she had no idea where the church with the funny clock was. Then Zadi was totally surprised when Philip said, well, I know where it is and I'll show you. Then Philip grabbed his auntie's hands and proceeded to guide her down back alleys and side streets and all of a sudden, in front of her was a huge clock face. She then asked Philip how he knew about the clock face and more surprisingly, knew exactly where it was. His response startled her even further, when he replied that he'd once lived here as a little boy called Andrew. One year later, his Aunt Rosemary was babysitting him, and he surprised her again by stating that, when I was Andrew, I saw Thomas Beckett being killed. She was again taken back, thinking, how does he know about Thomas Beckett? Thomas Beckett was Archbishop of Canterbury from 1162 until 1170, when he was murdered by four knights in the Canterbury Cathedral on December 29, 1170. How did Philip know of such an historical event? Philip explained to his auntie that when he was a little boy called Andrew, he was older than he is now and was six years of age. Andrew must have come from a family with money, as he claimed he was also able to write, which would have been very rare in those days. He said that for some reason he had left his home in Oxford to visit Canterbury and must have been amongst the congregation gathered for service on that fateful night in December 1170 and witnessed the assassination of Sir Thomas Beckett. Philip then went on to describe that when they were in the city before entering the cathedral, he saw lots of soldiers wearing masks on their faces walking around the city. The soldiers had large swords and their shields had drawings on them and they were very noisy and shouting a lot. He said he was in the actual cathedral and heard him being murdered. He said that there were lots and lots of people in the church where the men wore short dresses, which would have been tunics, while the women wore long dresses. Although he was only six years of age, he said he knew something very bad and serious was happening in the church. He said that he could not actually see Thomas Beckett because there were too many tall people standing in front of him, but he knew that Thomas Beckett had been killed. His Aunt Rosemary said that there was no way that a child as young as Philip would know anything about that famous event in history that had taken place hundreds of years before. Somehow, that historical event had left such a strong impression on a young six-year-old boy named Andrew that 800 years later, the vivid images are still present in his incarnation as a young boy now called Philip Harding. George Needhart the following account of a previous life did not follow the typical pattern of hypnotic regression for George Niehart. George was born in 1898 in Munich, Germany, and was brought up a Roman Catholic under a caring mother and a stern father, and between the ages of five and seven, had memories of previous lives, which he never experienced again until his twenties. When he left school, he started to learn his father's trade as a coppersmith, but at the start of World War I, had to give up his apprenticeship at the age of 19 when he was called up for service in the German Imperial Navy, where he trained as a radio operator. George fortunately survived the war and was demobilized on January 1, 1919. He returned to his home city of Munich amidst revolution and violence, where an economic depression was now setting in, and George was unable to return to his apprenticeship. He then married and had a daughter, but within two years, his wife had died, and he was still under 25 years of age. George's views on life were now completely shattered, and his belief in the divine justice made praying a struggle. He had no place of his own to live, and a friend allowed him to live in his house. However, it was during this period that George had an experience that affected him deeply, and was to transform his life. It happened one spring morning, after he had just eaten his breakfast, when an amazing mixture of images appeared in his mind. But he was not disturbed in any way, and his senses and thoughts remained clear. 
The images in his mind appear to be from another period in time centuries ago. The images were so overwhelming and strange that he immediately felt that he needed to write everything down. For the next 10 days and much sleeplessness, the images finally came to an end. What he had found was that the scenes and images appeared to be that of a former life and the details of the various names, dates and places gave everything a sense of plausibility. He also felt that he was able to identify with the principal figure of the whole picture and it felt like something had risen up deep from the deepest layers within him. He then made efforts to verify all that he had experienced from the images in his mind and concluded that he had not fallen into a delusional state when he had experienced the mental images. The inner visions that he had experienced had referred to a previous existence for himself. He came to the conclusion that earthly existences can serve as a punishment inflicted on a person as an outward expression of repentance for wrongdoing and can extend over many earthly existences. His memories started with the description of a castle around the year 1150, which he had sketched when the castle stood on a mountain above jagged rocks. Entrance to the castle was via a wooden drawbridge across a deep moat that surrounded the mountain. He was not able to get the name of the castle in his visions, but felt it was near a highway that was much travelled in that period of time. He spent the next few years searching for the location in an attempt to verify details with some success and began exploring the region in search of his past life. From the town of Regan, he set off into the Bavarian forest using only his intuition. He eventually came to an opening on the peak of a mountain where he found himself standing in front of the ruins of a castle which had been erected high above rocks. Only the tower remained standing. He then climbed to the top of the tower to see the view of the surrounding area. After a short search, he came upon the remains of a secret passage he had remembered. He later saw an engraving from 1726, at which time more of the main buildings still stood, and it matched exactly the sketch that he had drawn. He emerged from his experience with a different view of life and death, and had altered his view of life.